Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Lori Morse. Lori is the author of Reverse Heart Disease Naturally, The Woman's Guide to Not Die Before Your Time. She's devoted the last 30 years of her life supporting health and wholeness through natural medicine and creative healing. Lori has a master's degree in traditional Chinese medicine and is the director of holistic health services in San Diego, California, a 25 year private practice dedicated to supporting wholeness, however imperfect, through natural medicine. She weaves various combinations of energy medicine, acupuncture, herbal therapy, hormone therapy, nutritional therapy, together with spiritual disciplines, quantum chi breath work, metaphysics, and creative healing programs to awaken cellular intelligence and heal. She holds a degree in art and the creative process, as well as being a certified intentional creativity teacher. She works with women virtually all over the world. Welcome to the podcast, Lori. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes. So that is quite a resume that I just read of all those different modalities that you have studied and mastered and used to help people. Um, but not everybody starts out as a master. Tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? How did you start out? out? Like, how did you get into this field of healing and art? Yeah, well, I grew up in Southern California, um, between San Diego and Orange County, pretty much all my life. I've tried to leave a couple of times, but I always find myself coming back. I, you know, San Diego is just a beautiful place to live. Um, I, I ended up in corporate, sort of not by my choice, but it was just a job. And then I ended up being there for 10 or 12 years. But I knew very early on that it wasn't like it was soul sucking for me. I know it isn't for everybody, but I, I know that's not uncommon either. And I mean, I want to wake up like Mozart and Monet and, and be really excited about what I do every day. And so I would read all those books. I don't know if you remember those books, like What Colors Your Parachute and mm -hmm. Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow. And I did all the exercises and I knew it was something around health and I managed health clubs and worked in health food restaurants. And I, I was getting a little bit closer. And then um, I was reading books also on Chinese medicine and yin and yang and qi. And I, they just fascinated me. And I ended up crossing paths with a college here in San Diego. There was only one of three. It was one of three in the whole country at the time. And, um, and I just knew I had to study this medicine. So that was kind of like a new landscape, a new vista that opened up for me. And then, I, I mean, the healing arts is, is my purpose in life. I, I now know I'm a healer. And then over the years, just the modalities just started becoming woven into what I do. And uh, it's just a tapestry of what I have available to serve people now. And the art piece came up when I was going through menopause and I thought, oh man, this is tough. <laughs> I, need, I need a lifeboat here. And I kept thinking oh, I wanted to study art after I'd retired. And then one day I was like, why am I waiting? Just do it now. And anyway, I went through it and, and that opened up a whole nother sort of vista of how we can heal through more of a creative experience rather than some of the harder ways that we've tried to heal over over time in humanity and that's that's kind of the nutshell version and then i was approached by this uh, publisher in washington dc that really only works with authors who um, are about healing and transformation and anyway that was just a perfect fit and that's how the book kind of got birthed okay. wow yes and people are very interested in how to heal their hearts these days. So many people with heart attacks, heart arrhythmias, heart murmurs, heart right. break, broken hearts. Yeah. So much about the heart. Um, it's, it's true. You know, and it's, it's in every part of our life. I mean, it's our, 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 our it love. It affects everything. It's just everything. It's yeah. just everything. So as uh, Tina Turner would say, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking me that? <laughs> I'm asking you that. So when it comes to being having a healthy heart, what's love got to do with it? Well, it's, it's such a cool question, actually. I've never actually had it asked that way. So thank you for that. Um, you know, it, really, 
lo love is the entire fabric of the universe. It's in every particle of the universe. We don't always know that until, we're, until we have a journey where we discover, oh, that's, that's the truth of life, not the bandwidth of fear and all the crazy stuff that is happening you know, in the world. And even in our own minds, right? We have to sort of come to a place in our healing journey where we are willing to um, be guided by love. And that actually, like the temple of that love is in our heart. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have learned in my time with working with people that hardened arteries or blocked arteries or you know some of the symptoms that we think we just can take medication for and it'll be okay there's such a thing called broken heart syndrome you actually kind of said those words i don't even know if you know you know that that that's a a real thing mm -hmm. yeah i write about it in my book um and i learned about it from a cardiologist so it's not like i made it up <laughs> it's a real thing they've done research on it but my I guess my whole point is, is that all of these little symptoms that are cropping up are intelligent messages from our heart and our system to bring it to love so that healing can be as full as we have the capacity for it to be. Um, and, and a lot of times when we say the word love, we're sort of conditioned to think of romantic love. And it's really so much more than that. It's it's meeting love in ourselves and in the universe so that we're in a full connected partnership with love so that we can become all that we're designed to become. And that, then that happens, you know, through the relationship of our heart. So, okay. So tell me more about that. How do we become connected to love and how does that, help our health how, how do we get connected to that because people talk about love and there's like so many definitions of love right what is that love that we're seeking to connect with that keeps us healthy emotionally physically spiritually yeah well we could call it any number of things you know we could call it source we could call it life force Sometimes I like to use creative life force because that energy is um, very creative in its nature. And I don't mean necessarily painting, but, you know, we need to access our create, create, creative solutions all day long for raising teenagers and having businesses and being in good partnerships or relation. I mean, that we need creative solutions all the time. In the, in the Chinese medical model, it's called, the word is called qi. You know, we could say light, we could say atomic energy, molecular energy, all those words. Some people are okay with the word God or mother, father, God. Some people aren't like that just turns them off. So I really recommend, you know, to, to your listeners that they find the word that little, the universe is a word that sometimes is used. Find the word that speaks to them or that they can invite inside on an intimate level, as well as be able to connect to in, in, a, in a broader level, because it's both. And if you call it love, great. And if you call it something else, that's okay too. I mean, divine love is a, is a word that I particularly like, um, because that feels soothing or, um, I don't know, embracing, like I can access that in my heart. And then the next thing I would say about that is, you know, just placing our hand on our heart, heart math, and I also write about this in my book, heart math has done a ton of research over the decades about when we, about how to breathe and access uh, the field that, that our heart has access to. So when we touch our heart, our awareness can drop into that area because wherever we touch, our awareness tends to go. And then I would encourage people, this is how I started out. Like when I was 17, I was like, wait a minute, why was I born in America with food and not starving on the streets in like say India or Africa? And when I ask those questions of my heart, I always get an answer. It might not come immediately. It might come in a song tomorrow or something I read you know, in three days, whatever. But, you know, I always know that when I have an inquiry of my heart, love answers. And the more we do that, the more we begin to understand and feel like as a felt experience that we're actually connecting to love or, or source or creative life force, right? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, so the love you're talking about is the source the or the divine love that beats our heart. Exactly. That keeps us alive. Because without it, we're just we aren't we aren't just we have no life. Material. We have no life. Right. So is it this is getting a little esoteric, but part of that is our soul? Yeah, part of that is our soul. Our soul is just like the, uh, it's like the template of what our best experiences would be in this life in order to evolve ourselves as much as we possibly can in this life toward love. It's, yeah. So a lot of what we're talking about is like I'm understanding mentally and I'm um, thinking through it, but I'm still thinking, how do we practically practice it? Is there um, something I would say to myself or a practice? Some people meditate, some people do different things. Is there something yeah. I can do to help connect myself with love and my heart every day? Yeah, that's such a great question. <laughs> There's actually a lot of things. So we could talk until midnight about those, but let's just pick out like two or three, if that's okay with you. And um, so one of them is a three-step process that I mentioned just a minute ago that is, it comes out of the research of heart math. And so the, the very first part of that step is literally dropping into our heart. So our head wants to run the show all the time. So thinking through love is not the same thing as um, as connecting and feeling love. Does that make sense so far? Yes, because I think up until now as we're talking, I'm thinking, but I'm trying to understand what you're saying about the feeling and yeah, and going into my heart. That's the hard part. I mean, I have been asking the universe to help me feel love for years. <laughs> and I, and I started, finally started feeling it. And so, and, and a few of the things that helped me the most, I can only speak from my own experience and what I help other women to do that works. So this heart math thing. So the first one is dropping into our heart with our hand on our heart, slowing down our breath a little bit, just, you know, just consciously slowing our breath down. And the reason that we do that is because it signals to the mind and to the body that we're safe. It's a very physiological thing. If we're breathing in a faster way, then we're, we're always on the lookout. We're sort of a little bit in fight or flight. It's a stress response when we're not having a slower breath. And then act, in this case, because of your question, we can say, we can just repeat the word love or show me love or help me feel love. And it may not happen the first time we do that, but I can say that if one is willing to do that on a regular basis, I mean, you could do it at a stop sign or on the toilet, <laughs> you know, if we, if we need to multitask, so to speak, standing in the grocery store, I don't think it'd be too weird because this is all happening in our own being anyway, other than our hands being on our heart. Um, then, then we start to actually feel it. And the more we do it, it's like stringing pearls. All of a sudden we have this beautiful strand and, and it's tangible and feelable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I'm just wondering, so, I think some people aren't sure what love feels like. So let's say that you haven't experienced that kind of love. Maybe they grew up in a home that it was abusive or they had kind of a rough life or, um, you know, maybe they never experienced romantic love and they're thinking, what does this love feel like? So how do we know when we have that love in our hearts? I know that's kind of a, no, that's a great question. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So the difference between our mind spinning, which we all know very well, and and if, and tapping into a feeling, even if it's for a very short period of time initially, until we're able to sort of, it's a muscle building practice, really. So we stretch open those moments where we actually can feel it. You will know that you're feeling it because you will feel peace and you will feel more ease than tension, which is what we mainly get when we're mostly spinning in our mind. And you know, you, I didn't, I wanna circle back to what you said earlier, which is the, the, the fact that what we know now in quantum physics is that it is the energy of love that is the healer in every human body. 
So when someone is on a path of healing, their best return on investment, <laughs> to use business lingo, is to, is to build this muscle because they, you can't not heal when you're connecting to love. Wow. And um, that's really, it's making me really think about that. Um, and I, I think just practicing it is going to help integrate something like that. And yeah. I've heard this before, and I'm sure other people have heard this too. They hear, you know, women get like breast cancer or heart problems because they're taking care of other people and they're not taking care of themselves. What are your thoughts on that? You know, every, um, every wisdom path or truth path or spiritual path has as one of its teachings that we must keep our own cup full first. And women are pleasers. And while there's nothing wrong with that, we're coming to a point in, we are at a point in human history where we cannot, women can't leave their, themselves um, out of the equation. And so it, it, we have to discover ways to keep our cup full so that what we're doing and what we're offering and what we're giving from is a full cup. Otherwise, we will be faced with messages from our system that demand that of us. And those are called symptoms, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, are there any fallacies about how to keep your heart healthy that people believe and they practice, but you know that they're, they're actually um, a, a mistake people are making about you know, how to keep their heart healthy. I mean, yeah, well, you know, there's, um, so Western medicine has, it, it has medications and for some people it, it's important to actually take, like if their blood pressure is off the charts and it's been that way for a while, it's really important. So they don't have a stroke that they lower their blood pressure. And, and so, and there's, there's beautiful things that have come forward in Western medicine that have, that are saving lives every day, right now, as we're talking, you know, there's stints, there's, um, there's heart transplant. I mean, the, 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 the things that have been, you know, brought forward in Western medicine are amazing. The thing that is, the thing to know is that those don't always mean that we're pulling the roots up as to why the heart problem came about in the first place. So it's both and, you know, anyone needing life-saving measures, they should take them. <laughs> yeah. But they should also be very um, willing to uncover the reasons, the root, you know, pull the roots up. And those are things like, it's all over the internet. When, when you Google, like how to, how to overcome heart disease or, you know, how to heal from heart a heart attack or something like that. Nutrition is really important. Movement is really important. Um, and, and Western medicine even acknowledges that. The research is absolutely clear on that. Some of the things that aren't necessarily talked about in mainstream are this, this things like the connection to, to the higher wisdom or the higher intelligence that we started out talking about. And things like um, tending our emotional pain you know, there is a doctor I, I I loved, and he I mentioned him in my uh, in my book as well. He said he's been a cardiologist for twenty years, and he said uh, that Western medicine, as m incredible as it is for all the reasons that I just said, has come to the end of its road in terms of it its capacity to support the broader scope of healing that needs to happen when there's a heart issue for someone. And he says the forward movement and the best momentum that people will get from now forward has to include emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual healing. And for that to come out of a cardiologist in Western medicine's mouth is pretty it telling. Yeah, yes, it is. So let's just start out with these different parts. Nutrition. So there's so much information out there. And, you know, some people say, well, do, do keto because, you know, high fat is actually good for you. And some people say, no, don't do any fat, become a vegetarian. 
and, and so the, the general public, especially if you're not studied in nutrition, you're thinking, gosh, I want to be healthy, but what do I eat? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I come across this every day, Kimberly, people are really in a state of confusion. So I, and I've done it all just for the record. So I never, ever make a recommendation to someone unless I have had personal experience with it. Cause I just don't feel like that's a, a, an integrity thing to do. Right. Um, in general, for people who have, who are needing to heal a heart problem, um, the, the more fruits and vegetables they can eat, the, the better. Like that, that's what the research says. So, you know, that's kind of not something that we, that's debatable, right? I mean, even for the most part, keto people are all about vegetables too, right? Maybe not so much the fruit, but that's another piece because they're trying to keep their um, carbohydrate intake low. Um, what I find interesting in the keto world is that a lot of the, a lot of times, I don't even know what the percentages are of this, so I don't want to misspeak, but a lot of people who do well on keto are a little bit more on the younger side and they maybe haven't had a heart uh, uh, event. Um, but the research is very clear that the more fruits and vegetables you eat when you're trying to heal your heart nutritionally, the better. And whether that means you include a little bit of fish and chicken or, you know, whatever else, that's a personal choice. And, and maybe each individual has a, has different chemistry as far as what then their cholesterol will do or their inflammation levels will do. Um, and it's a little bit of an experiment, but you cannot go wrong if you eat as many vegetables for sure as you can eat and you know a modest amount of fruit um michael Pollan, he's written a number of books the omnivore's dilemma and um he's a he's a journalist i don't know if you're familiar at all with his work but one of his quotes is eat real food mostly plants and not too much and that's probably the best advice now then people have to figure out how to do that <laughs> yeah. right but at least it's a starting place Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. That at least gets us going in the right direction. Yeah. What to do. Yeah. And then talk about movement. Um, we were talking earlier and I told you that's one of my favorite subjects because of my background in using movement to change brain pathways. So how do we use movement to help our heart? Well, um, and this, I'd love to have your insight on this too, just because you studied movement and brain pathways. You know, we, we, Every, every, first of all, and you know this as a doctor, the body, the human body wants nothing more than to be in homeostasis or physiological balance. And so we know that there are certain things that support that and movement just ha happens to be one of those ingredients in the recipe. Um, it is imperative for a, 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 an organ such as the um, heart in the cardiovascular system and ev all the reach it has in the body through blood vessels and veins and which carries all the nutrition by the way and delivers that nutrition to all of our cells that requires for that muscle to be healthy and strong so that's why like uh, cardio you know it's called cardio work like walking and you know whether it's bicycling or you know all the things that get our heart rate going that's what helps to keep that muscle strong and able to pump all that blood you know, to the bottoms of our feet, to the top of our head, right? Like that's a big job, especially against gravity. And the other reason it's so important is because the body is constantly in, in all of its activity, just walking from your car to your front door, it requires um, use of muscle and the use of that muscle has a cellular byproduct. And that cellular byproduct, once it's done its job, becomes toxic and needs to be flushed out. And it's the lymph system that flushes that out. And the lymph does not have its own pump. It's the, it's, you know, the cardiovascular, uh, the heart has its own pump. The lymph system does not. And it's like this big river of a cleansing river in our body. And the only way it is able to work is through our movement. So those two things alone are vital for healthy function as we're nourishing our body and cleansing our body all day long. And I know it's very popular, especially um, in the United States, to go to the gym right, or to do your daily exercise. And that can be various things. And so I'm about to ask you a controversial question. Do we walk? Do we run? Do we bike? Do we... Do interval trading? Do we, what is good for our hearts? 
Yeah, well, I'm gonna, there's a two part answer to that. The first part is our exercise, which I'll come back to because that was your question about do we walk or do we what? Uh, the other part is there's a woman who worked for um, NASA for over 30 years. She's a physicist and she discovered so many good things. I, I talk about a lot of her work in, in the movements uh, chapter in my book. I don't know if you had a chance to read through that part, but um, what she discovered is that there are so many non-exercise activities that a human body needs for heart health, for blood sugar balance, for muscle mass strength, everything, brain health, everything, that we don't do anymore. Like we don't get out of our car and open our garage door. We don't hang our laundry. We don't, you know, we have all these machines that do that. We sit all day. And she has discovered that we need a minimum of 32 um, level changes every day where whether we're laying down to standing up or sitting down to standing up, doesn't mean you have to run in place after you stand up, but you can't, the human body is not designed to sit for longer than 15 or 20 minutes. So just tending to the non-exercise physical movement is huge all, all throughout the day as much as possible. And then back to the exercise component, walking is researched to be excellent for hearts. I, I'm, I used to run, and I think that people who start, you know, hitting 40s, midlife, let's say, 40s, 45s, I'm not sure, and old, older, I'm not sure that running is the best choice. High-intensity interval training is excellent. So however one does that, that is, the research on that is incredibly good. And it's also a way to get a, a half an hour exercise in and get a power punch to it and and not feel like you have to walk for an hour and spend an hour every day if that's a time you know time constraint is a problem so um yeah so i love high intensity i think stationary bicycling is really good i'm talking about the things specific for heart health you know there someone who isn't tending their heart you know and they're and they're in the shape that they've always run and running isn't a problem for them and they love it no not a problem but for someone who's forcing themselves to run and they don't really want to, but they think they should because it's going to be good for them, I'm not a fan of that. I think that we have to, dancing is a beautiful way to move our body. Mini trampolining is a beautiful way to move our body. So does that answer your question? It does. And you mentioned one of my favorite ones for brain health too, which is that mini trampoline. Mm. It just reboots your brain. It's so helpful if you're ever feeling down or not feeling that good or not that motivated, just get on your trampoline for a few minutes. It doesn't take long. I couldn't agree. I have that same experience. And you know, we haven't even touched upon, because a lot of times people with heart stuff and brain stuff, they, they, can, um, they can often have a little bit of a lean into depression or all the way in. And movement is really good for that. And it changes the way our body communicates hormonally near, from a neurotransmitter perspective. Um, our microbiome is supported by movement, uh, you know, and then in terms of the brain track stuff that you are really well versed on, it's, it, it's just such a good match. Mm -hmm. And does the brain itself have a lot of effect on the way our hearts are um, working or is that more emotional? Do you want to, that, that is such a cool question. Do you want to know something really funny? not funny, amazing. There are brain cells in our heart. That's so a lot of people think it's all about our brain, right? There are literally, and they call it, oh, there's a special word, they, a name they call it. It's like the, um, it's like this, uh, they don't call it the small brain. Anyway, there's like over 40,000 brain cells in our heart. And what is becoming more and more understood by research is that it's actually our heart's brain cells that if allowed, call the best shots on every level. Choices, emotional stability, access to love, you know, from our earlier uh, chat part. Um, and then the brain follows suit. But when we cut all that off by spinning in our brain and staying in our head, then we lose that vast intelligence that is just waiting to support every aspect of our life. So it's actually the heart first and then the brain. Got it. And um, that made me think, again, I'm kind of going off in little tangents here, but it's all good. thinking about, you know, there's some people that they get a heart condition 
or some kind of serious health condition. And some people somehow through their um, either uh, intense deciding to get better, they, they get better. Like some people, they seem to just bounce back and, and they, be, they become healthy again. And then there's other people that they get the same, maybe the same condition, but they just yes. keep going down and sometimes they're even pass away. So yeah. is there anything with the heart in those brain cells that help with that? Or is it, again, is it emotional? Well, um, I, I think the first thing is that everything we do is a choice. And when we include our heart, we make way better choices for ourselves than when we don't include our heart and we only go based on our mind because our mind is almost all the time operating from the past. The heart has access by way of a, of a very um, researched field of awareness that we don't necessarily see, but it's still there. Our heart has access to all possibilities. It also has access to um, the present moment where we're not being driven by all only our past and our fears and our our old wounds and trauma and you know betrayals and heartbreaks and stuff like that when we're only in our head we can only operate from that place so um yeah so i, I kind of i think i lost track of the beginning part of what you were asking but actually that was oh, that oh was i know i know what i wanted to say we have to make a decision to live and if we don't make a very conscious decision to live and that conscious decision to live would be including our heart, then we're, we're not going to be on a track of living and healing. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So we've talked about several things, you know, connecting your heart with love, um, you know, the nutrition, the movement, what other things should we attend to or really look at or pay attention to, to keep our heart healthy? Yeah, you're, you ask such good questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, well, we sort of touched on the emotional piece. So uh, there, and this is a two part thing too. So the first part is that we, everybody has these emotional energy tangles there. It's like pain that we've lived with, whether it's from grief, from loss, from trauma, from when we, from any point in time in our life. It could be pain that we carried in with us through our DNA, you know, through our lineage. Um, it, it's betrayals and frustrations and things that haven't worked out the way we wished they have. It's literal heartbreak. Those are the things that are asking us to be healed. Now, most people are really afraid of those because it, it almost feels like a like it's all stuffed in a closet door and if we open the door it's going to all come tumbling out and suffocate us um and that's how i had i felt that way for a long time and almost everyone i talk to feels that way and uh and what i can say unequivocally is that when we when we open that door and we have you know we're we're including our our heart in the journey and we're and i literally ask like okay i have this thing that's coming up i'm really afraid I know that it's in my best interest to just literally turn and, and face it. And uh, will you help me do that? Like I asked my heart for that help. I asked divine love to, to support my me in doing that. And I am, I've never been denied that help. And I don't think anybody who asks from that heartfelt place is denied. It's only the mind that starts blocking things out, you know, blocking things off. Um, anyway, so that, that's the kind of what's up right now is that we, is that we are willing to do our emotional healing work. Now, that being said, there's a buffet of ways that we can do that. There, you know, like going to a buffet in somewhere where there's lots of food. We can't eat all that food, right? We just pick what we like. One of my favorite dishes on that buffet to heal is by way of a creative process, a creative healing process. Um, and lot, lots of times when, I'll, when I say that right away, people say, oh, well, I'm not creative. I, I don't have a creative bone in my body. But that is not true. And I would highly encourage anyone who feels that way to read that chapter in my book because it, it, if you're alive, if you have that creative life force, that, that um, 
you know, divine presence within you beating your heart and pumping your blood, like you said earlier, then by nature, you have, uh, you have, you are an extension of that creative life force. It doesn't mean you have to run out and be a painter or a sculptor, but it does mean that your heart is asking you to access a bit more of your creative expression in order to heal. And it's the best way that I have found, Kimberly, the most gentle, an enjoyable way to move energy that's that's old and emotional you know that emotional energy tangle stuff that we talked about uh, and it does it's transformational and it's like it's like creative alchemy and it it's like amazing <laughs> how that works when you engage in it and I do give a, a, a very simple way of doing that in you know in my book it's just a yeah, easy and I was thinking you know creativity can be so many things it can be um, putting together a big um, pot of soup. Totally. Um, creatively deciding what to put into it. It can be putting your garden. You couldn't be um, more right. I mean, it could be anything. Um, putting together a group to go somewhere. You know, there's Setting so many ways to, be to welcome people over for dinner. Mm -hmm. All of that is part of being creative. And, and people don't realize that it's so broad, the capacity to be creative. It isn't just only this narrow focus that they don't consider themselves to be a part of. So thank you for saying that, because that's absolutely right. Yeah, is there anything else we could be doing or anything daily? Well, one of the other, there's, so there's, well daily, I would recommend, so I have this thing <laughs> where every time I go to the bathroom, because I drink a lot of tea, so I have to pee a lot. <laughs> So that to me is a good reminder, like an association to, um, to connect. So I literally connect in to, you know, the source, it's a source. And I ask it to flow into me and to, you know, pour out of every cell of my body. Mm. People don't realize that we have like 37.2 trillion cells, some say more in our body, like that's what makes up our body. And inside every cell, is as many atoms, so 37.2 trillion or more atoms. And inside every atom is an electron. And that electron is, is cellular intelligence. It's our blueprint for health. So when you think about it, it's like, oh my gosh, that is so much more wholeness and health than the other stuff that isn't quite working better yet. So when we access that and when we, when we ask our heart to activate that and awaken that and, and flow it throughout our body, um, that's a big ask. And, and it's, it, Matt, it works, right? Right. Like it causes change in our body. So the more we can remember to do that throughout the day and people often say, Oh, I don't remember. And it's true. Start your day out that way. Maybe if you're willing to set your alarm, or just use the bathroom break as a, as a way to remember. Um, then over time, building the muscle again, you start being shown what are your best steps? What are your best healing modalities? What are, what are the ways to talk to your doctor to get uh, a higher level of um, healing support from them? You know, like it, it opens up a whole new vista I, I we keep using that word but yeah yeah and you know what helps me and my kids actually laugh at me about this i have you know little sticky notes i have them on my wall i have them on my mirror i even have them in my bathroom <laughs> my, yeah. or i write literally write things on my mirror and my red lipstick on top Okay. I want to always be present to what I'm concentrating and focusing on and what I want to build or create. And so I put these little notes all over. And like I said, they laugh at me about it, but it's really, really helpful. I agree. I agree. That, that's living by intention, right? And unfortunately, we need those reminders because otherwise our mind hijacks the whole game and thinks it knows what it's doing. And honestly, if the mind knew how to heal our body, she would have done it by now. She doesn't know how. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to include our heart and every cell of our body in the, in the process. Yeah. So I love that you do that. I do too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and whatever reminders we need, I think are perfectly valid. <laughs> 
So if people come to see you, you, you know, you have a background in so many different kinds of medicines. Um, if they were coming to you and they're saying, you know, I've had some heart issues or my mom and my grandma yeah, had if heart that, issues yeah. and I am now 45 and I'm a little worried, although there's no signs, I'm a little worried that this might happen to me. How would you work with them? Would you, do you start with blood tests? Do you do some testing? Do you give them a questionnaire about their connection to their heart? How do you work with people? Yeah, well, the first thing I do is I just do a heart health assessment with them. A lot of times people already come with blood work. And if they don't, then, you know, it's easy enough to um, give them what they would want to ask their doctor for in the next time or schedule an appointment to get this blood work done. Um, and that's just one layer of it. The heart health assessment, it's very personal to each person, right? Like some people are, I just finished working with a woman who was already into whole food plant-based. So she was on that, you know, but not everyone start, you know, has that together. So I go through their, um, their connection to life uh, and I go through their nutrition, I go through supplements, I go through um, their movement, I go through their relationship with time, I go through their emotional, um, where they are emotionally, and then I make very specific um, recommendations, you know, and I, and I walk them through it so that they are held not only accountable, but literally held in a, like, it's a sacred container for healing. Because sometimes we don't, we just can't do that ourselves. You know, we need someone who, that's what their mastery is to do that for them. That's wonderful. And sometimes it's hormonal for some women. There's like some hormone tweaks that are necessary. Um, it's whatever they need, you know, to, to walk themselves to heart health. And do you believe there's a place in there for supplements or should we just get everything we need from our food? Well, that's such a good question. There, of course, re, you know, both sides have their, their good uh, arguments for that. My general rule of thumb on that is, is if someone is struggling with a health issue, more often than, than not, they need a little bit of supplementation. If we're healthy already, then we can probably get most of what we need from our food. But then there's the idea that the soils are depleted and like magnesium is a perfect example. The heart must have magnesium. And foods don't have, I mean, this is research, like the foods that used to 50 years ago have this, this levels of magnesium only have this levels now. So we're not getting enough and the heart muscle all muscles, but the heart in particular must have magnesium. So that's something if someone is struggling with their heart, they should take magnesium, you know? And there's a few supplements like that. So it's not always as cut and dry as yes or no. It depends on the, the person and what their needs are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've been told to take me magnesium at night. I, I, asked I, guess, um, I, I guess it's called calm or something. Oh. That's, that's the powder that you make a little tea out of and then you drink it before you go to sleep. Is yeah. that important to take it at night or should... Well, if not all supplements doesn't matter, but this one is, is one that is best taken at night because it's a mineral. So there's a, there's a heavier nature to minerals than there are to other supplements or herbs. Um, and so it tends to be a, a little, there's a little bit of a weightiness to it. So it helps people with their sleep. It helps them have better bowel movements in the morning. But the, the, the time that we sleep at night is when our body restores, repairs, rejuvenates. So if it has the material essence that it needs during that time at night, then it will, it will have a better chance of a higher, more optimal repair. Yeah. So just to summarize, because we've talked about so many things, the connection, the movement, the nutrition, the emotional piece, the um, taking that time to just center in your heart and just feel that love connecting throughout your your whole body. It seems yeah. like a lot to do. <laughs> it does. It does. And I, I can say a couple things about that. Are you asking me to say a couple things about it? <laughs> Is... Um, one, they're all things that are natural to being human. So 
in the beginning, it might feel a little bit awkward or clunky because it, you know, maybe it isn't woven in yet to our natural rhythm of the days. Um, but there, these are things that the human body wants. So once we just get past that initial few days of awkwardness and we're willing to stick with it, our, our heart shows us ways to weave it in no problem. Oh, okay, that's easy, I can do that. Yeah, I can, I can connect while I'm on the toilet. You know, I can breathe at a stoplight, <laughs> that kind of thing. I can practice mindfulness and presence um, when I'm in this meeting, if, it ha if it's not offering me anything I need to hear right now. I mean, you know, there are, and our, and our heart will show us those pockets, those crevices and cracks. And, you know, I ask my heart to show me those places. I say, show me all the cracks and crevices in life where you are, where, where love and laughter lives, where, you know, where what I need for my highest health, it, you know, it is so that I can, you know, have this as part of my, my regular day. And it's easy. You know, you, we can also ask spirit to make this easy and um, graceful. Like it, we don't have to suffer our way through it anymore. That's an old energy signature that is, is out. <laughs> it's like, you know, past, past energy time. Um, but the other thing was, what, what did you say? You said about weaving this all time and did I answer your question? You answered my question. And I actually had another, that gave me another question. Okay. You talked about the cracks and cruises. I thought about, you know, heart disease and you hear of, people having a heart attack when they're under stress or they're in stress and sometimes doing something pleasurable right. <laughs> and, and, and it's stressful for them. Um, how does that play into everything that you're doing with people? Well, what I'm doing with people is helping them to reverse the momentum towards the tipping point of a heart event, right? And research is clear reversing heart disease and preventing a heart attack or a stroke is doable you know that's not that's not a question it's just it's just like people a lot of people get frustrated because they're like well what do i do i'm already eating a lot of vegetables but the, you know it's a multi ingredient recipe including these emotion this you know everything that you already listed um there's a, another chapter in my book ca called uh i can't remember what exactly what the title is but it's it's about our relationship with time and it helps us discover that time isn't as linear as we might as the mind would have us believe um and that it's a little bit more circular and connected to the quantum field than we realize and I give ways to actually connect into that so that we can actually begin the process of trusting that our, our system, which is bigger than just our body, connected to the fabric of love, the benevolent universe, the quantum field, will actually order everything in perfect timing if we ask for it. Oh, that's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Oh my God. I tell a couple stories in, in that chapter that are like, you can't, it's undeniable that it works. Yeah. Because yeah. when I think about, you know, um, situations where like there's a mom, she's working, she's taking care of four kids, she's yeah. taking care of the house and she looks at her to-do list and says, there's no way I'm getting this done today. Right. But if you think about time being more three-dimensional, I guess. I don't know if that's what you're saying, but time being more flexible, like you can flexible actually- is a perfect word, Kimberly, yeah. Yeah, you can actually move the time around or you can shift things. And I don't know if it's really all happening just in your mind or how it's happening, but if that feeling of, I only have this much time for this and this much time for this and this much time for this, and it gets overwhelming. It's true, you're absolutely right. And she might even have an aging parent that she's taking care of in that mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I think that that's a brilliant word, actually, flexible, because um, we tend to think of it as linear. We look at our to-do list. We say, I can't get all this done. And that's all very limited, uh, linear and overwhelming. When we start practicing the idea that time is more flexible, there's this there's this experience that our to-do list is no longer on a list, but it's, it's living, it's a living energy um, 
I don't know how else to say it, like dynamic feed in connection with the universe and the perfect timing, the perfect things, the perfect people we need to help us will be, be, will be made aware of. And it's actually way more fun to do it that way, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the stress to-do list overwhelming is not fun. No, no, it isn't. And as you're talking, I know other people can't see you because we're on the, the podcast right now, but she's got her hands and she's making this big, almost like a circular ball in front of her her showing that it's almost like this big space where you could have little cells of things to do and you could like move them around yeah. the way you it's like to. You could see the whole picture and you can move things around to make it more graceful, more ease. You're absolutely right. So uh, what Kimberly's talking about is I was moving my hands because we have the, about the, the um, about the, so, what am I trying to say? The, when we put our hands out to our side, about that distance away from our body is about the uh, amount of field that we have around us. When we're aware of that, uh, it's connected to the quantum field. And when we place our to-do list items in that field, it does require a little bit of playing and trust in the beginning. But once you realize how this works, it's like you'll never do it any other way again. So you place your to-do list in your field Connect, and you know, connect with your heart and say, I'm a little nervous about that, but your to-do list is still there. So it's not like it's going anywhere, right? I'm asking for the perfect timing and the perfect unfolding of everything on my list. Everything that needs to get done today will get done. Whatever needs to be tomorrow will be tomorrow, but I'm gonna trust and I'm asking you to show me how to trust that my connection to you and my field have my back on this and then play with it. You know, oftentimes people don't want to give their whole to-do list up. So I'll say, well, just give like from the time you wake up in the morning on Saturday till say noon, just play with that time frame because you know, your world's not going to fall apart if you're playing with it just for half a day <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and see how it goes. That is a beautiful picture that you just painted there. Thank you. How yeah. to do that. So, so I'm going to change gears a little bit here. Let's talk about you. What gives you right now in your life? What gives you the most happiness? enjoy I am the most happiest when I am in a creative uh, a creative expression and I try to make that happen throughout the day I do love to paint I love mixed media I was one of those people who did not know how to draw a stick figure I dated artists because I, I was getting I wanted to be near like this idea of being a creative but I didn't think it was me <laughs> Until one time after the third breakup with an artist, I was like, oh, I think I'm the one who wants to play with my creativity, right? So anyway, and what I can, what I know for a fact that it, it, it's just about playing with it and it doesn't matter the outcome, it matters ha what happens. And specifically when we talk about creating with intention. So I mean, what I mean by that is I'll go to a, a, a journal page or a printer, a piece of printer paper, or you know, a canvas if I'm gonna be that formal about it. And I will write on that page an intention, like I really want to sleep better, or um, I, I would like this relationship to have more ease in it, or whatever the thing is. I mean, we have long lists of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And then I just follow my heart and I just play, I pick out colors I like, I write things, with, you know, I might use uh, watercolor pe pencils that I can later, you know, blot out with, with water and they, they make this cool thing. And that entire experience is part of what changes the energy. And it is magic. I almost used a off color word. It is magic. <laughs> yeah. So um, that is literally my favorite thing. That is awesome. And um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm an artist and I love I didn't painting know. also. Okay. But what I like most about art is that you can never make a mistake. It's exactly perfect every time when you're creating it and it comes out of your hand or your mind or your, whatever you're creating, it's perfect. You're every so time. right. You're absolutely right. And don't they call them happy mistakes? Like, don't you discover the most amazing things through your mistakes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I actually had an art teacher that told me if you're, if you're, painting looks too perfect do something to mess it up because yeah. 
<laughs> it doesn't look authentic anymore. You have to do something to make exactly. it so it doesn't look like it was printed in a factory. You want it to look perfect advice. Personalized. I love that. That's so good. What so what kind of art do you like? Um, I like painting mostly, but I do stained glass and I like glass and light and color. And oh, that's awesome. I I, yeah. I, I love yeah. knowing that. Beautiful. So but I just want to tell you thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah, it's my joy. Yeah, I love having this conversation with you. Yeah, all you're contributing and it's been so helpful to learn about, you know, keeping our heart healthy. And do you have any last words of advice? On um, I think I would say to everyone listening, um, if, you, if you're willing to include your heart in your moments, you will be nothing but surprised and delighted. And, um, and your mind will fight a little bit initially, but eventually she'll come along. I, I actually say to my mind, sweetie, I know this feels scary to you. I'm, our mind is designed to do nothing but protect us. Mm -hmm. So our mind thinks that if everything we've done up until now has kept us alive, then we should do nothing different. So every time we try to do something different, like maybe sit down and draw something or paint something or whatever, or, or do an emotional release or whatever, she throws a fit. She'll throw a tantrum. But if you know that, so what, I, what I'll say to her is, I know you're scared and I know, and I, I'm not mean to her because that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, like talking mean to myself, I, that I had to give up a long time ago because it's just too, it doesn't work. Anyway, um, so I'll say, but, but I'm going to do this. I'm just going to do this one little thing. You can stay back or you can come along, but we're doing this. That's called good parenting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, um, and then go with what the heart is asking and discover, let yourself discover how safe it is to include your heart in your moments and to, um, and to explore places that before felt you know, fearful to do so and to let love show you how safe it is to live with love. Wow. Thank you. And before we wrap up, um, how can people get a hold of you? Um, how, if they want to come see you or if they want to get a copy of your book, um, tell us about what you offer now. Yeah. Well, what I would love to do for your listeners, Kimberly, is, is give them a free copy of the book so they, they can just read a little bit more about what we talked about in, in our time together. Um, will you have that link or should I tell it now? You can tell it now and I'll put it in the notes. Okay. So let me just <laughs> make sure I don't give the wrong thing. So it's um, www, a guide to not die before your time .com slash ebook dash free copy and the the website the website is www.aguidetonotdiebeforeyourtime.com and you can also get the copy of the book on there um, but and then you'll you could read more about the stuff we've talked about on that on that page too so that should give you everything you need and then if you have any questions or um, you want to do a heart health assessment for yourself to just discover where you're at. All of that information is on the main page, a guide not to die before your time.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for all your contributions. And oh, it's been um, wonderful talking to you. Yeah, I feel likewise. I, I've loved your questions. I loved our, our conversation. I, I know I talked a lot, but <laughs> thank you for, it's been my joy. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, Kimberly. Thank you. Bye.